Okay. Um, so we have a couple of things today. Uh, I don't want to introduce any new heavy material. Uh, so I will just talk a little bit about some of the uh, some of the things that we've already discussed, uh, but kind of remind a little bit uh, about some some of the things. And I uh, posted two videos uh, for today's lecture. Um, so this is a, a talk. He um, um, he has a um, couple of talks. Uh, all about modeling um, domains in a functional fashion and using uh, functional patterns for programming. And his examples are very good. Um, he Unfortunately, he's not using Haskell in his kind of a code snippets. He's using F sharp, but the syntax will be really easy for you to, to understand. And it, it's not about the syntax. It's, it's about the ideas of how you use uh, some of the uh, functional patterns for um, modeling and like expressing some of the relationships that you have in your domain. So this is one example talk, uh, but if you if you check him out, so yeah, let me let me um, show the his name. So it's a uh, uh, stop. His name is. Uh, Scott Vlashin. Um, yeah, like if you if you check him out, he has more than this talk, and uh, I I like his talks. He, his talks are kind of very accessible, very easy, uh, and um, yeah, he talks about um, the different type system features and facilities that you can use in um, in your Rust or Haskell programs. Both Rust and Haskell they have those. Um, algebraic data types, and you can kind of take a full advantage of them. Uh, so one, uh, one simple example that I, I wanted to, um, to show today, uh, let's, let's, yeah, so let me see. Oi, 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 oi. Come on, computer work. Right, so if I um, if I want to express uh, so so one one kind of fundamental concept that uh, he also talks about uh, is the formulation that makes something that is illegal or something that you should normally that you normally would deal with some assertions kind of impossible to be expressed. Right. So let's let's say we have. Um, uh, the student example that we that we used at the very beginning, uh, and we have a function which is called set h. Okay, so set h uh, takes you know an h and um, returns a person. Uh, it takes a you know a person and an h, so it takes a person, an h, and returns a new. Uh, uh new new person okay so let's do this capitals and returns a person with the new h right so if, if i have a function like this um and i have um two parameters and i return a person and then i change this to be an int right um, I can have a situation where this int is negative or if that int is zero, and then I have to deal with those situations, right? So in C or, or kind of imperative programming, we often do that. And then if I have a function like, you know, set h, um, and then I have an h and the h is uh, integer, uh, and then I return, um, I return a person or, or something, right? Then uh, I will have Kind of an assertion here i will say assert that h is more than zero right and i can have kind of a runtime check that that kind of a precondition is not violated and if it is violated i will kind of throw uh, i will have a runtime error or runtime exception or whatever whatever that happens right so that is very common pattern 
uh, because we kind of deal with uh, situations where the variable or some expectations are violated. We kind of dis describe here that age should be, you know, uh, you know, something that is uh, between one and I don't know, 130, like we had in the students, students example. But this is something that, that you have to deal with, like this, uh, the violation of um, certain conditions that are required for, um, for the behavior to be correct. Right, so if, if we say, okay, age must be larger than zero and smaller uh, and smaller than 130, right? Um, then we would have to have this assertion everywhere where we deal with age. Uh, we discussed this already, uh, but I, I kind of want to reiterate it. Um, so the way to kind of handle it is to make your function in such a way that it will never happen. So how can you do this? How can you make this never happen? Like that you will have illegal age to set age function. Well, you know, it, it's kind of very trivial and you kind of do that without uh, adding ad any overheads in, in Haskell. You kind of change this to be an age. Uh, you add a function which says uh, create age and this function takes an int and returns you an age uh, and it, then you define your type uh, you, you define the type h to be h um, int, right? And then in this function, if you pass something illegal, you will never return an h, right? Again, you like following the same mantra for following the same um, situation. Like, okay, what will happen here if you if you uh, pass zero or, or negative numbers? Well you will not be able to return an age. So you basically have to say, okay, so then I have made the age, right? Uh, so this function will always return. This function will always return correctly, but for invalid values, it will not give us an age because that's impossible. You cannot have an illegal age. The age will only have values that you defined, right? So here uh, we only return legal age instances. Right, um, and then by doing that, you don't have to deal with the problem of your program being having some something illegal. Uh, you basically have to constrain what constitutes a legal age here uh, in this one place, but then everywhere else in your code where you're dealing with age, uh, you can be guaranteed that the age is between zero and 130 as you want, like you know, whatever the requirement is, right? So assuming uh legal age is from zero to 130 right uh whatever the assumption is i mean i'm not arguing for a given assumption uh this is just an example like that is a little bit stupid example because what if a person lives 231 your program will kind of crash it will not be able to deal with it right uh but maybe uh, maybe you you pick like 200 or whatever was the the longest possible life right um you there is a risk with those assumptions anyway, uh, same as, you know, uh, famous uh, Bill Gates quote saying that computers will never need more than, you know, 512 megabytes of RAM. <laughs> and that turned out to be a little bit of a uh, wrongly assumed um, assumption. Uh, but, you know, this is just an example. So let's say the age is between zero and 200. It cannot be uh, between one and 200. It cannot be zero and it cannot be uh, negative. Then your age will be constrained by, by this function. And then if you try to create an age which is um, invalid, that function will return none, right? It will not return a, an age. And then, then you, you have your function which cannot be passed illegal things. Um, so by kind of working out what is that you don't want to deal with, and pushing it away, then you can kind of make your design and make your domain expression kind of simpler and make your code tidier, right? Um, note that like this function, like if, if I set just h here, I would have again the same problem because I can pass an illegal number here. Uh, and then what, what do I return? Like what, what will happen here? Um, I have to return something like the, the functions have to return something or they have to throw, they have to crash, right? 
and we don't want programs to crash we want all the functions to be always returning um, valid values uh, so so crashing is you know sometimes um, it's good practice to crash early if you are developing a particular algorithm and you don't want to carry on uh, with the um, wrong computations then you should crash early uh, but for some for most systems uh, you know crashing in runtime is undesirable so when your system goes into production you tend to remove all the you know uh, runtime crashes because you fixed all the bugs already which were causing those runtime crashes uh, and you want the system to kind of uh, gracefully be able to recover from a wrong user input or whatever right that, that the reason why this function gets a negative age is not a programmer's problem it might be a user input problem right so we as programmers we try to make sure that all the programming problems are fixed and for programming problems crashing early is good uh if if it's definitely a, a fault of a programmer you should have crashes i mean that th th they help you to fix those uh, programming errors but this having a zero or negative numbers here is not a programming error it, it may be you know invalid data from your csv file or uh invalid user input or whatever and then your program needs to deal with it um so if i just have age i still have the problem that i cannot return an age and then like i have to throw an exception or i have to throw an error or crash but if i just change it to maybe then i can return none and then whoever called me will have to deal with it you have to tell the user okay maybe the age is invalid right um when should you use maybe and when should you use either uh it depends it depends on your strategy on error handling and how deep you want to go with the error handling or with the uh, meaningful information to the user right in this particular case i don't see any differentiation between like passing here zero or passing here negative numbers or whatever like if someone passed a wrong number to me it's kind of a binary thing i i either got a correct number or a wrong number i don't need to differentiate different types of errors right so because i don't need to differentiate different types of errors uh, maybe is a perfect uh, solution here uh, because you know if, if there was an illegal number i just return none um, that communicates that that the error situation right um, if on the other hand you have um, for example you have a function which is uh, create person right it takes some parameters and at the end it returns a person um, and that may fail uh, because all those parameters which kind of constitute a person could be wrong then maybe i need to like i could say okay the function failed right but if all those things like if this function takes let's say four parameters um age name whatever whatever like again as we as we had in the students example then i will not know what went wrong if i just return none like if you want to communicate to the end user like uh, through the front end that something went wrong you will not be able to tell what went wrong right so here maybe i need an either and then i have kind of an, an error type which will tell me what went wrong right so if the age was wrong or if the name was wrong then i will say okay name was wrong or age was wrong um, if everything was fine i return a person but if something was wrong i will differentiate what went wrong so for those situations you may uh, need kind of a, a more meaningful information back and then having this either type here would be more useful right uh, than just having maybe so by the way uh, if i have those um if i have those functions like create person which returns me a person you know uh, create a car create age what what is it in object oriented programming how how we call them how we call this pattern huh yeah it's like creating an instance but like what is that pattern called so let's say um let's say i have this uh, uh record type so i have a data type person 
uh, which is, uh, you know, uh, kind of a record type. And then I can say uh, my P person equals person. Um, and then I pass, you know, age, name, whatever, whatever the parameters I need, right? So I create a, a P instance of a person. And that's one way of doing it. And in, in uh, C++ or Java, I, I would say P equals new person. And then I will pass all the parameters here, right? Um, that's one way of instantiating an instance. But I, if I make the constructor private, I, I don't have access to this constructor. And if I don't export this, this um, um, type instantiation function, and the only way to create the function is to say create person, right? Uh, and here is to say uh, create person and pass parameters this way. And I don't have access to the constructor directly. How is it called? It's called a factory pattern, right? So um, instead of talk directly instantiating things myself, I have to ask some, some uh, I have to ask, usually you don't have it in, uh, in, in Java or C++ as a function. Usually you have something like a person factory <laughs> dot create person and that person factory has a static method which kind of returns you a person, right? Um, in functional patterns, we basically have a function which does the same thing, right? Uh, you, you can have it in a module. So I can have it in some sort of a, you know, a person module uh, and then uh, differentiate those functions by the uh, namespace. But I do, it's effectively just a function, same as this one. This is effectively a function. It will be a static function. Uh, and then I have just sort of a namespace around to make um, a little bit more modular design. And this factory pattern is kind of useful in object-oriented programming because what I can do is I can have a, I can have a pool of objects and instead of creating a new object, every time you ask me for a person, I may just give you the one from the pool, right? And then when you're done with it, I can kind of reclaim it and without reallocating memory, I can be kind of managing the memory for you, right? So the person factory can be managing the factory for the user in a more efficient way than if the user was always saying new and kind of delete, new and delete, right? Uh, so if I have, uh, let's say I have to process, um, I have to uh, process some JSON file and I, I, and I have, a, you know, a 1 million people to process, right? Uh, and I have a loop and I'm kind of uh, doing it. Uh, yeah, a, a loop is a bad example because in the loop you would have kind of an inner variable inside the loop, which you would not um, um, change, right? But um, if you imagine that it's not just a simple loop, but we're doing more complex things, uh, then uh, I may need to have like access to two people at the time, but I never use more than two people at the time, right? So then I can kind of process this million people by only allocating uh, those two variables and then interacting with my uh, factory such that I kind of get and uh, return the, the instances back to the pool such that different threads or different functions can kind of only reuse what has been already allocated, right? Um, if you allow everybody to do a new person, then you kind of lost control of which thread and how many and like how people are like allocating it, like the, not people, the functions. Um, but if you're using the factory pattern, then you are kind of more in control. So in object-oriented programming, we often use the factory pattern because of the more efficient way of managing memory, uh, whereas in functional programming, we do uh, this part. We do use this pattern um, not only for the um, internal memory management sake, but because of the abstractions it gives us and the kind of the encapsulation of of um, uh, of dealing with particular states that are deemed potentially illegal in in the in the structure, right? So I hope that that is. Um, that is clear. So, um, any questions about this? In, in Haskell, you can basically hide or export some of the things and uh, 
control what the end user of your library or the end user of your API will see and how they are forced to use it, right? If you let them create a person like this with the parameters here, then they can use it like this. But if they, if you don't export this, um, if you don't export person, uh, person like this, then they will not have access to that function. They will have access to the type, but they will not be able to make an instance of it themselves. And then you can kind of uh, um, um, export the create person function. And that is sort of like a factory pattern. Okay, so that's, um, that's one kind of a um, small thing that uh, he talks about, and that is kind of important. And then the other one is, um, he talks quite a lot about the um, uh, algebraic data types and this kind of ability to say that you have a type, uh, you know, my type, and then it is some instances, right? So for example, if you are doing assignment two and you have a token, you can have, um, you can, for example, in, 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 um, implement different instances of the token type, which will represent, for example, an int for you, or you can um, you can make a string and, and so on, right? Uh, and you can kind of represent some of the variation of what the token can be, and then kind of encapsulate it in, in this, uh, in this um, algebraic data type. Uh, you can do the same for errors, right? So if you have your error type, you can say I have uh, H error, I have um, a name error, and I have the surname error, right? And that's that's all fine. Those are kind of a unit instances. You basically have, um, um, you, you don't need to carry any extra information or any, any additional data with this, uh, because then you can, uh, if, I, if you got an error, you can say case error off, and then you can deal with age error, um, differently and, and so on, right? You can kind of dispatch on the on the type that you got the error of. Uh, if you need to carry extra information, if you, for example, got an H error and you want to have some user string, which further differentiates uh, something, you can have, you know, an int as a flag or you can have a string here, uh, but you, you don't have to. If, you, if it's not needed, you, you better keep it clean, right? Uh, one thing to remember about this is like, if you think about bool, it's basically true or false, right? That's how uh, that's how a bool is defined in Haskell, right? That's that's it. Uh, you you basically have a bool type, and it can have two unit values, true or false. Uh, if you want kind of a tri logic uh, bool system, you can you can define it yourself, right? So you can say I have a three. Uh, bool logic system and I have true, um, false and uh, extra or something, right? You will have conflicts uh, like namespace conflicts. So maybe you, you want to kind of uh, change the names for, for something else. Otherwise you will get a bit of a um, errors in uh, dispatching what you mean, uh, but that's basically it. Um, Carrying extra information, and it is exactly the same in, uh, in Rust. Uh, carrying extra information, uh, like for example, adding extra things here, you can add as many as you want. Uh, and same as with the normal types, uh, if you need more than one, maybe what, what you will do is you would kind of have an, a record here, right? So um, if, if you need um, like two or three things, then instead of saying I want an int, string, and a float, right? Um, maybe what you do is you you say I have some um, I have some context, uh, and my context, yeah. So you would say data, and my context is, um, and then you would have the um, yeah you would have the the names like of, of your context. I don't know like I don't know what uh, what that could be. Let's say h. And that would be an int, and then you have um, a name, and that would be a string, and, and so on, right? So you, you will kind of uh, want to name those things such that instead of saying those three things, 
you would say, okay, I actually have uh, an age error and it is with the context. Uh, and then you can kind of uh, look inside the context of what those three things are. Uh, if, if it's just one thing, if it's just like one int or one string, then it's fine to just put it like this because uh, you don't need any extra information of what it is. Like it is in the context of the age error. Um, so those are kind of a small little tricks which will kind of make you a little bit more efficient and a little bit more effective in like designing and modeling like the, the domain for, for your projects, for your, uh, for your code. Okay, so um, yeah, any questions about this? It, we, we had it, like we already had it, we've, we've used it. Uh, I'm just kind of reminding you and this talk, this talk kind of reminds you about this again, right? Uh, so I sort of talked about making illegal things impossible to, to be represented in the code uh, and making use of the type system. So those, like, you know, they are trivial, like fundamental, but it, it takes some time to get used to them and like really make them, um, make, make them efficient under your fingertips uh, such that you kind of feel it. Um, okay, so, so watch the talk, uh, focus on those two things. And then the last thing is this learn once and use everywhere. It's kind of a nice paradigm for making it possible for you to, to transfer what you learn from one language to be able to use it in another language. Um, Haskell and Rust are so close in a sense of the type systems that it's quite nice to be able to transfer one into the other, right? Uh, once you understand maybes and eithers, it will be the same with the result and uh, option in, in Haskell and in, in Rust. It's kind of the same concept, right? And once you get used to it in one language, it's kind of yeah very trivial in the other. And then if you go back to C++, you will miss it. You will miss that there is no uh, result or option type. Like you can't really do that, right? Um, so this talk is kind of a, a more lightweight talk. And uh, the guy is sort of talking about various um, programming languages and various ways of how in his personal journey through programming, he kind of discovered those uh, relationships and he tried many different languages. He was hyped on, on many of them. Uh, and then he kind of ended up, you know, using Haskell, right? So it's kind of a, like a, a little bit of a personal journey of what um, this kind of a particular language, what it teaches us about other languages and what other languages are borrowing from, from Haskell effectively, right? That's what the talk is about uh, because uh, Haskell has been a precursor for many of the features that, has been, that have been added to many of the more modern programming languages. Um, and I, I kind of enjoyed it. It's like, um, I haven't used all the same languages he has used, but my personal journey through the type systems and through the programming languages was quite similar. I was really hyped on, on C++ and I really loved it at the time. Uh, and I thought everything can be really nicely expressed in uh, object-oriented metaphors. And then, yeah, I sort of didn't kind of um, appreciate it so much when I discovered Java, for example. I actually loved Java more than C++, right? Uh, I liked some of the... Um, patterns and some of the metaphors and some of the expressiveness of, of Java at the time as well. Um, so I, I kind of moved to, into Java, but I've noticed that I'm, I'm kind of sometimes even less productive as, as he noticed. Um, and then I sort of uh, learned uh, Lisp and, and Scheme and I learned some of the functional paradigms and I learned Go and, and so on. And I sort of, I can see that the object orientation is um, is losing the, the grip in the industry. Like, of course you have it everywhere and everybody is still using it, but it is, there is a lot of publications and there is a lot of uh, kind of patterns which suggest that the kind of uh, sub, um, subtyping and the hierarchy of types and the kind of the object orientation metaphors are not the best, uh, that there are better ways of dealing with some of the domain modeling and with some of the design patterns and, and so on. So the, like, and he makes this argument as well. So he, he kind of argues that 
uh, it's not gonna disappear. We, we're gonna have uh, object-oriented uh, languages and uh, yeah, object-oriented uh, paradigm, which is used in some of the languages, through some of the languages, of course. Uh, but it, it is sort of um, losing some of the grip uh, in the industry and we kind of going away from some of the patterns that were thought being helpful and they are not that helpful. So for example, in the UI designs that used to be the, uh, the holy grail of object orientation that everything is some sort of object. You have this ability to, um, uh, to ma manipulate and compose like uh, views out of other sub views. And you know, it, it kind of made sense. And we were teaching um, a lot of object oriented patterns using kind of a Java GUI libraries because everything there is kind of a uh, some form of a widget or view, and then you can compose buttons and things like this and, and so on, right? It, it kind of makes sense. But at the same time, over the last few years, people were really uh, experimenting with systems like Elm or ImGUI, and they are not object oriented, they are functionally oriented. And the, the functional flavor to GUI design feels better, it feels kind of more robust, and it gives you some of the uh, optimization facilities that the object oriented ones don't have. And, you know, GUI is like, if, if, if the GUI is only for the human uh, in the form of menus and things like this, that's kind of okay. It doesn't have to be super efficient. But if you're thinking about GUI in terms of like games or something that needs to be super efficient, then this object orientation gets in a way. And it kind of gets in a way, even in a browser, if you have to render all the complex kind of uh, nested uh, visual structures in a browser, for example, for HTML and so on, uh, having this kind of object-oriented paradigm on top of that makes things even less efficient. So the you know a lot of uh, new uh, programming paradigm uh, programming languages they use kind of a functional paradigm to express the GUI relationships and like how you manage the state and how you refresh what needs to be refreshed and, and so on. Um, and the object oriented design, it was like if the user clicked on something, you have this kind of a hierarchy of, of ownerships and you have the parents propagating the change down to all the children and you have this kind of a cascading effect, which you know somehow needs to be managed. Uh, and then, um, yeah, it works, it, 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 and it's kind of nice, like from some perspective, but from some other perspective, it, it is unnecessary. Like you can do certain things more efficiently if you kind of turn it into a more um, functional flavor, right? So, so this talk is, yeah, as I said, this is more um, abstraction-based talk. Uh, this one is more practical with some uh, F-sharp examples, but the syntax of F-sharp is, so simple and he gives so simple examples that it will not be um, a distraction. Like you will get the idea. Like it, it is slightly different than Haskell, uh, but it, it should be fine. All right, so. Yeah, so there is a question about the exam. Uh, I will talk uh, a little bit more about the exam like uh, next week uh, when we will not have like normal classes anymore. So I will tell you a little bit more uh, how the exam will work. Uh, because the course runs for the first time, we don't have any past exam examples. So I will not show you like last year examples because we don't have them, uh, but I will give you some examples of what you might expect. Uh, oh, in, in general, you might expect things from the lectures, some conceptual questions about uh, some of the thinking and some of the abstractions, and they will be questions about BPROC, the, the programming language that you've developed the interpreter for. Uh, and there will be questions about assignment one, the free assignments, the non-compulsory assignments, and uh, uh, an assignment two. So some of the kind of uh, thinking and some of the questions will be about that. Some questions will be not having kind of one single correct answer. It kind of depends. And you may need to argue like why you pick this over something else, or what would you pick, even if you haven't implemented something. The question might be, oh, how would you do this? And then you can say, I would do it like this. And then you have to say, why? Uh, what are the advantages of doing it this particular way, right? So the exam is a little bit 
a mixture of kind of thinking and programming. Um, it's we we will try to make the exam as little memorization based as possible, and of course the exam is open book, so you can look up the syntax or you can look up things on the on the internet anyway, right? So try to <laughs> try to write correct Haskell or correct Rust, uh, but if you have some spelling errors or if it would not compile, that's not really a big deal. Uh, it, it's more about your way of thinking, but it as I'm saying, like the exam needs to be a little bit uh, about your thinking because it's kind of an open book exam. Like you can look up things uh, online anyway. So the questions will be, it will be, uh, you know, uh, uh, a multi-choice mixed with uh, short answers mixed with some code snippets format, right? And it is, I think it's three hours. But as I said, I will talk about the exam uh, next week when I actually have it prepared. Uh, and then I can tell you more and I can show you some example questions um, about this. But yeah, that's more or less like this. Uh, any other questions? I have seen that uh, two groups uh, set up the uh, projects uh, and that's great. I would like everybody else to do the same. Um, so uh, put uh, put yourself into the table and put who is in the particular group uh, and what you're planning to do. Um, you know, the the rules and objectives are kind of as they were des des designed before. Um, you can do whatever you, you want, but just try to make it small. Uh, I don't want the project to be to be big. Uh, it can be smaller than assignment two, um, it should be smaller than assignment two. So it, it's a little bit up to you. Um, the only requirement is yeah, just kind of a put here what you want to do and then let me just uh, check. Uh, um, the ones that are listed, they are fine. Uh, this one might go overboard if you try to do too much. Don't try to do too much, just try to do the minimum. Uh, simplify everything that you can. Um, yeah, don't don't make it big. Uh, and then I, I check the um, I check the proposals like and I checked the, the those things and they are kind of okay. Um, you what else? If you want to, um, I, I prefer people spending more time on assignment two than on the project. So the project should be smaller than assignment two. If you haven't finished assignment two, then finish assignment two um, and then do the project. Assignment two is more important than the project, especially because we will talk about this concatenative language, the, the BPROC uh, in, in the exam and in the evaluation a little bit as well. Uh, even if you haven't done the assignment two, uh, you don't need to fully finish everything, but you need to kind of be able to think a little bit about the um, the concatenative uh, way of expressing things. Um, so, yeah. And as I said, like I'm, I'm trying to make the exam being more thinking rather than memory. So ideally, you should just check all your code, all the things that you've done in the course. And you don't really need to study for it. Like all the things about the syntax or like how you express things, you can look up during the exam. Of course, you will be more efficient if you remember most things, then you have to look up everything. Uh, but uh, you know, you, you should not need to really study for the exam. You just need to make sure that you sort of understood the concepts. Um, and if you understood the concepts, then you, you're probably fine. Yeah, programming exams are kind of tricky. Um, I don't have a lot of good experience with uh, programming exams, like from my uh, teaching kind of career. Uh, most uh, exams that I had, like in New Zealand, they kind of were scored quite poorly compared to the programming assignments that they're done during the semester, uh, because the the people who like the exams that we had were kind of mostly focused on short answers. 
So you have to kind of think and, and, and express something in English, uh, what and why and how and things like this. And it kind of um, most people who are kind of good in programming, they have hard time explaining in English like why they do certain things certain way. Uh, and then the, the people who are not necessarily good in programming, they can kind of talk more about programming for some reason. So, you know, so. Uh, yeah, so the project, um, yeah, let me check what did we uh, set. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. What What do you think? I would think that would uh, that it might be reasonable to drop it to um, thirty, maybe. Um, it is it, it it is kind of a guideline. It's not kind of a definite. Um, yeah, but yeah, I I I guess we could re uh, redo it a little bit and make the the uh, the core tasks and assignments a, a little bit heavier uh, compared to the project. So thirty five is a bit too much for the for the final project. Yeah, maybe we should. Um, what What do you think? Yeah, exactly. So and and also so so the question is here that most people are putting the uh, emphasis on assignment two, and I also ask you to uh, to put emphasis on assignment two. Um, we can we can adjust that. Um, So yeah, I also may I also think it makes sense. So I I would be happy to um to go with sixty five and twenty five. So then, if we consider um yeah. And then there is a 10 extra. Yeah, what do you think? Yeah, yeah, let's keep it. So uh, 65, 25, and 10 for bonuses. OK. Um, any other questions? Any other um, things that you need to discuss? If not, then uh, please uh, check those two lectures, uh, especially the first one. Uh, the first one will kind of help you with the with the tasks because it it is kind of a refresher of uh, what to think of and how to do some of the functional patterns. Uh, that one you can leave after the course. Like uh, that one, you should do before the exam. Um, the presentations are part of the portfolio. And they are more or less informal. Uh, they will not be graded, but if you don't have it, then uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, I don't know. 
I would like you to have presentations because that kind of a communicates um, to other students what everybody did. So it's good to have. Uh, it will take a little bit of time to, to actually do it. Um, but yeah, it's up to you. I uh, it, like it is part of the portfolio, but it's not a huge percentage, right? So if you skip it, it's not gonna hurt you a lot. But if you kind of on a great boundary, then it may tip you over, right? Um, So Sebastian is saying, how is the presentation going to be? As I don't think people will prioritize making super cool projects. No, it's not about making super cool projects. It's just about like telling what what you know what you've done in the in the group project. Like all the other assignments are individual, and it's a little bit hard to share. So that's why I was sort of uh, doing a little bit of a summary for everybody's approaches. Uh, but if you have a project, you can kind of tell others like what you've learned, what you discovered, like how you solve some of the things. Uh, so it's not about like being cool, but it's more about like just show and tell session, right? Um, and it can be a small thing, like it can be like, as I showed you today, like just simple thing, like uh, making some state being not re represented or something like this, right? Um, for assignment two, they then read about their handling that well and design them to have program continue. Then so the case says it should crash. Yeah. Um, yeah, so uh, Ricard is saying that he changed his design that the program, that his interpreter will crash on error and that's perfectly fine. Uh, there is no, no need for anything extra. Um, if you want to be fancy and if you want to tell the user kind of exactly wha where and what happened, you could go, uh, but that's kind of an extra. You don't like it. the uh, the specification for the assignment was basically suggesting that uh, you can simply just crash uh, on error. Oh, okay, okay, okay. So I misunderstood the, the, the statement. So if, um, yeah, so that, that is an interesting, so, okay. So if you have a, let, let's say I have a BPROC program, which is illegal, right? So let, let's say I have some, um, whatever, like I, I, I uh, start, let's say, right. I start uh, an array and I start a string and then I have, um, and I say, hello, and then I don't have anything else, right? And then I say, maybe print. So then that's the illegal program. I'm, I'm kind of, I haven't closed the array and I haven't closed the string. And then I have a function which will pick something from the stack. And then I don't know what that will be, right? And if your program executes and does something, um, you can argue that you, you try to model Python <laughs> or, or JavaScript, uh, which tends to work even if the program is clearly kind of invalid uh, and then uh, have some sort of a meaningful thing. But um, you, you may have to make a case for it, right? So it's not strictly necessary for the program to crash, but it's easier to crash the program than to explain why the program doesn't crash and it makes sense that the way it currently works right um, i did played with the with this myself a little bit so for example for this let, let's make the program simpler so let's make the program like this so i have a hello uh hello world um i can even say world right and then it doesn't have the closing uh closing bracket uh cl closing string right so that um, my prog originally my program was not crashing, but it was putting on the on the stack an error uh, error saying um, not finished string, right? But it would kind of eat up. So it would like my tokens are like um, this, 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 and this, and then I'm missing the closing uh, closing quote. And then I will put this on top of the stack and that's what the program will finish with. So the program will not crash. It will kind of execute this, 
but this will be what I will have at the end of the, of the run on top of the stack, right? And then the interpreter will print this, will say, okay, uh, the program finished, uh, everything went fine, and that's the outcome. That, that's, the, um, that's the final thing that is on the stack. Um, and then what you can have is you can have um, like uh, small little things. Uh, so for example, if I have if I have a quotation, if I have a quotation like this, and I said exec and print, right? So now the quotation is legal, um, but the quotation puts on the stack this error. Right, so I will execute this quotation. This quotation will put this on top of the stack, and then I have a print. And print will basically print this error and then finish legally. Right, so again, I have no crash. Like there is no crash in the interpreter. Like the the program has been interpreted fully, but it kind of worked with the with the error being printed by the code. Right, so I kind of played with that myself. That my interpreter would never crash. It would always work but it would always work in some sort of meaningful way. And that is kind of complex to, to do that this way, right? It's actually easier just to crash at that point saying, okay, I'm closing the quotation, but the string hasn't been closed. So, you know, something went wrong and boom, you crash here and nothing else happens, right? So it's up to you. Uh, but if, if you, like you don't strictly need to crash, you, you can do something else. But this something else may mean that you need to do more work. It might be simpler just to crash. But if you want, you can do this. Like uh, you can play with non non crashing interpreter that tries to always recover from the programs that have errors and treat those errors as if they were intentional, right? Uh, because I was also considering like, what if I want to have non closed strings on purpose? And then have an error on top of the stack, and then somehow use it in my program as a feature, not as a bug, right? I'm a kind of a programmer that programs intentionally this way. Um, yeah, why not? Up to you. But if you do it this way, just explain what were your choices and why you made them. So, no, you don't need to crash the program, but you need to uh, think how your program works and what are the um, the consequences of your particular implementation. Yep. Yeah, and as I said, to be honest, I, I did try that. I tried uh, my program, my interpreter never crashed. <laughs> and it was kind of fun, uh, but it led to more work. So, okay, any other questions? Can we do if statements uh, in Finfix? In fix? Yeah, so that was already a question, and um, I think uh, Elvis might have asked it on the on the um, issue tracker. Uh, so the question is: Do do we need to say uh, kind of in the normal bprog one we have condition if, and then we have um, yeah I um, the then quotation and the uh, or block or the else, and it is in this in this notation, which is kind of weird, uh, but it, it's weird on purpose, uh, and it's weird on purpose for historical reasons because um, you know um, fourth has it kind of like this. It it kind of makes more sense to have it like this that the if function takes three pops three things from the stack and then uh, checks the first one as a condition and runs the second one if it's true and runs the um, third one if it's if the condition is false yes that's perfectly fine perfectly legal to do it uh, when you do that call it prog uh, b prog uh, b prog two so i am actually re-implementing my b prog with this and the same for the uh for everything else that takes the, the quotation from the right hand side, such that all the functions always pop arguments from the from the stack instead of from the program uh, program list, right? Uh, so if you do it this way, uh, just say you've implemented bproc2 uh, because then I can run the tests which I will have for the bproc2, right? And I, I will uh, try to um, to finish it and post the tests that I rewrote for this because all the tests currently. Uh, which are in the repo, they uh, they work 
like with this um, than else, uh, but you need to rewrite it, right? Yeah, perfect. So if you already rewrote some of those tests, then uh, make a pull request and then I will include them in the repo. That would be fantastic. And we, we call this var variant of the language bproc2. So bproc2 is purely um, uh, using the notation based on the stack, not from the program uh, list. Um, there are advantages of doing it this way. Uh, there are not many advantages of doing it the other way, uh, apart from the fact that historically it was kind of done the, the other way. It, it makes more sense to do it the bproc2 way. Okay, so Elvis did something else. He did uh, uh, quotation, oops, quotation, quotation condition. And then if is, so which one is the true branch and which one is the false branch? Is that one true branch or is that one true branch? Yeah, so, so this one is the true branch and this one is the false branch. So then you're kind of popping things as you use them, right? Um, that is uh, also very interesting. Uh, so Elvis is saying um, that we have, that he did it in such a way that it's, um, yeah, let me say it's an else then condition if. Right, so what, what happens is we kind of read it from right to left. So if condition is true, then do this branch, else do this branch. Um, again, that is more consistent, right? Because we then always read the code from, uh, from uh, right to left. So if condition, then else, um, which is more consistent than, um, condition then else if, right? Uh, because we, we read that part from the right hand side, but then all those arguments from left to right, right? Uh, again, uh, th this is kind of stupid, but that's how fourth implemented most things. And that's also how division is implemented, right? So the division, if I say A divided by B, it, it is, so, so this one is equivalent to A divided by B. But if I follow the same logic as for this, uh, what we should have is if I say this, then I should have A divided by B, right? So I say, okay, divide A by B. I'm reading from right to left, right? Um, so that, that is... Um, that's another variant which would again be consistent, right? Uh, where everything is uh, kind of always from right to left. Um, th there are no languages like that, right? So the language, the concatenative languages that exist and exist historically are either bprog1 or bprog2. This one, that, that, that one which Elvis implemented, uh, doesn't kind of exist currently, and that would be the most consistent one, right? I would like that one the most, right? We could call it bproc3, uh, and that one is um, always purely right to left, right? Um, yeah. The the bproc the bproc the bproc one is sort of the most consistent with uh, with fourth. And then uh, bproc2 is kind of a improved version, which I think a factor is using for some of the things, um, but not for everything. But consistently, they always pop the, the arguments from the stack kind of left to right. No, uh, um, yeah, left to right, not right to left. So those, th those are kind of a good discussions to have, and then you can do whatever you, you feel like 
and then just in the readme file argue why you feel that one is better right it, it doesn't uh, it, like the spec so the original spec which was um bprog1 is not necessarily like a not compulsory you can uh you can implement your own so if if you have uh implemented this one and you have tests make a pull request and call it bprog2 and for elvis if you have tests for your one uh let's call it bprog3 and then kind of uh make a pull request with your test as well um i was not implementing that one i was kind of implementing this one such that i can test the people who are doing um who are doing this this variant It is um, so. One way of thinking about it is because um, so. Um, yeah, let let me explain. Let let's see. So if I have my program, right? So I have my program, abstractly speaking, uh, which is some sort of a list, right? Um, and I'm kind of executing that list from left to right. Okay. Um, so I, I have to do a pass over my program and I'm kind of doing that pass from left to right. And then by doing that, I end up kind of operating on the stack, right? So I have my stack. So if this is a bottom of the stack, then I have some value one uh, or token one value two and so on. So I have some values or some tokens here. Uh, and then I have a top. Top, top value on the stack and my program kind of always manipulates the top the top of the stack right so then depending like which way you organize it then you have the choice of doing something with the top before the next thing will be kind of doing something with the top right so for example this notation is much more friendly for manipulating or changing the condition before you have to you have to do the if statement, right? Um, if you have this notation, you kind of stuck with whatever is here because like, so, so imagine the program, imagine a program that kind of is doing something. We're doing something, doing something, doing something. And then we have a condition and then we have the then and else blocks. And then we want to do something before we check the if. Then we can't really with this because we have the else and then on top of the stack and then condition is kind of a deeper right but if i turn it around and if i do this um if i do this condition then i can say okay my condition now is a bool but i can say not i can kind of change the condition to be the negation of the condition right or i can say and something and whatever another condition right condition two so i can kind of expand what I'm doing with condition by squeezing something between the if and this and those that that, that, that sequence uh, with this model that it, of course it is possible because you can reshuffle the stack you can kind of uh, kind of uh, extract the condition put it on top of the stack do something with it and then put it back in the third position from the top you can you can build instructions that do that and in fourth and factor you you have those instructions that like you know take the third element from the stack and put it put it on top then you can do something and then you can put it back to the third position but that's an extra code right if you have condition already on the top then making a negation of the condition is, is trivial like you can kind of uh, do it here um you may say yeah you know it doesn't matter if you need to modify the condition and you have this uh blah 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 condition uh, then else if then you kind of need to be doing it here, like squeezing stuff here. But that changes a little bit the, the feel of what you're doing. Like it, it makes the, the stack and the program a little bit more static. If you're doing it this way, that final section is more that dynamic. You can kind of generate it on the fly. You can kind of uh, postpone the if and do something else, right? Um, you can even like, you know, if you really fancy, you could do this. You could say, I actually have if as a quotation, 
and I don't execute it yet, I just put it on top of the stack, then I kind of, uh, you know, swap the two top elements. Now I have a condition on top, I will negate it and I will swap it back and then I will execute it, right? I, I can kind of express more logic on top of my if statement by kind of manipulating the condition, which is kind of here. Uh, and it is easier to do if the condition is here than if the condition is here. So I kind of like bprog3 approach uh, more than the bprog1 or bprog2. Uh, and it kind of allows more dynamic kind of programming patterns in, in bprog. Um, so depending on the, on the syntax, it kind of makes it more, uh, more concatenative and, and more, uh, you know, uh, feel like a, a Polish reverse notation more, right? Uh, so yeah, go ahead. Uh, if, if you can put uh, the, the code into the repo, that would be great. So Sebastian is saying, I'm also wrapping all my test results in, um, in a list uh, to illustrate the stack. Um, yeah, it's fine. Um, So that's how my, uh, my uh, tests work. They basically return the top element of the stack. And if it is not what you expect, then it's an error. Um, but you can, um, you, so, uh, and I also have this, uh, so let me explain. So I have, um, okay, so, I have some uh, pure functions and um, so, so let's say, I don't remember what they are called, but let, let's call them like interp, interp, and then interp one kind of uh, takes the program and uh, returns, let's say it returns the, the stack, right? Uh, and then interp, interp two takes a program and then return something more fancy, like uh, some state uh, that is an error if the interp2 returned a stack that has more than one element, right? And then you can write tests for your interp1 or interp2. All the tests that are currently in the repo are kind of written for interp2. So if there is an error, that will the, the test will fail, right? Because I'm using the API, which is kind of uh, basically doing this, right? So I run the program and I expect the state to have a correct outcome, which is one element on the stack and that's it. Uh, but you can, but internally in my, even in my own implementation, I also had the, the tests written for when I'm doing something like I have a program and I want to interpret it and I want to see if I got those two elements on the stack, right? Uh, so I had tests which were kind of basically for the interp one as well. So if Sebastian has this kind of a, um, a case, then then that that will be fine. Um, I yeah. So Sebastian is saying, okay, what if I have a one plus one two one two plus, and then I will wrap the result and and check it against three. Um, but why would you do that? Why, why would you want to wrap it like this? Uh, and then what would be the difference? So what if I have an array of three, you interpret it and then what would you wrap it, double wrap it? So you would have like this. I mean, th those are two programs, right? So this is one program, which is legal. And that's another program that is legal. Uh, and this one results in a number three and this one results in an array with a value three in, inside. Um, Yeah, you may need to explain. Like, it, it may make sense. I don't know. Like, I, I don't know why would you have it. Uh, but if it kind of, if you feel it makes sense, then uh, just describe it and maybe it, it's fine. Uh, I, I don't know. Like, to me, this 
Uh, this one just returns three. And then if your test says it should return an array or a list with uh, element three in it, then it, I would think why. Um, but maybe for some reason it makes sense in your case. Uh, I would expect this to be three, right? And my, my tests, which are in the repo, they kind of don't drop the result into the, the, the list. If you are testing something that, like, if, as I said, like, for example, if you're doing tests for interp one, right? And you're returning a stack and you have a program that is like this. So let's say um, you have program like this, right? And then th this program ends up with the two values on the stack and we kind of represent the stack as a list and we have three on top. Um, I, I'm using a, like a Haskell list here. And then you have one, right? And then you say, okay, I want to run a test for this program and I expect this as a result. Then that's perfectly reasonable for testing this level on, on the level of your interpreter, which in, uh, uh, returns the, the stack, right? Which returns the list. Um, so for that level, it's perfectly reasonable to, uh, to drop things into the list because it is a list, right? So for this program, the list would be this. And if you have a legal program, the list would be this. And that's perfectly reasonable way to do it. But that, then you're doing testing on, on this level, right? Uh, if you're doing testing on this level, then that makes no sense because you expect a single value. And then uh, you don't expect the list. I, I mean, you can get a list as a single value on top of the stack, but that's uh, different. Yeah, exactly. So, uh, so the um, if you basically doing the tests on that level, then of course it makes sense to have a list. Uh, and you, you should keep it like you should keep those tests for yourself internally, but for like an external test uh, for the like, let's say end to end tests, uh, you should add an extra test layer which basically tests on this. And then if your test has more than one element, uh, like on interp one, if you have more than one element of the stack, then this test for this should just fail because that the state will be kind of an error, not like a result. But, but I totally agree that having tests on that level is useful. And, and I have them myself as well, because I want to, to, to check some, some different programs, like, you know, like programs like this. I had tests like this as well, uh, just to check if I end up with this, right? That, that makes sense. All right, um, if you have uh, more questions, uh, fire them up on Discord or um, issue tracker. Spend some time uh, on, on assignment two. As I said, uh, there will be a little bit of discussion in the exam about this, about those various things. So the more, you know, the more thinking and the more time you spend with this, that then it's like you don't have to spend that time during the exam. Uh, the exam should be relatively straightforward in terms of uh, what you will need to do. And you can always look up like syntax and things online. So it's mostly about like uh, understanding how things work um, and what choices you've made. So as I said, some exam questions will be uh, neutral. There will be no single best answer. It kind of depends what you're doing. And you basically, the answer depends on like the quality of, of the answer depends on how, how you explain, right? All right, so I will stop here. Um...